Yeah, it's amazing. When we talk about joy, I always think about our church in Devundu. You can ask any of our team, and I know is also there, and a couple of our team who've been there before. It's amazing how joy has nothing to do with our earthly circumstances. But there is a joy in that church, and let me tell you, they don't have much, but they have joy. And sometimes I think, what is, what is richness? What is richness? Come on, it's awesome. Maybe if one of the team can just close that door for us just a little bit. We definitely don't want to silence the voices in our kids' church. Amen. Are you with me this morning? Awesome. Are you good, church? It's nice to see everybody here. Can I see who is new here for the first time? Or do we know everybody? Is there anyone new here? Yes, I was about to say, awesome, welcome. It's great to have you in the house with us. And uh, I want to encourage you, after the service, there will be a team there. They want to bless you with a little something. So make sure you go and get that little blessing. It's tiny, but we just want to say you're so welcome here. Awesome. Church, are you ready for the word this morning? But we are always excited to be sharing the word. Why don't you close your eyes? I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to head into it. Father, we thank you this morning for your word and for your presence. And we thank you, Lord, that we need both. So today, Father, I ask that you would speak to us, Lord. Holy Spirit, that you would lead this service as you've already started doing, Lord. And Lord, I pray that we will receive the seed of your word today in fruitful soil. Lord, that the seed of your word today will germinate in our hearts and will produce a harvest so big we cannot contain it. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Awesome. I want to speak about a theme this morning that I believe is one of the biggest keys to living a victorious kingdom life on earth. Okay, I want to speak about the joy of the Lord. But my title is a little different. I felt like the title should be, Where is my joy? Who's ever felt like, Where is my joy? I think many of us can relate. Many of us are maybe currently in circumstances where you're asking this question. You don't wake up with a song in your heart every morning. You don't wake up with a hopple in your stuff. But you know, the joy of the Lord is much more than a happy feeling. The joy of the Lord is much deeper. It is actually a supernatural deposit from the Holy Spirit that will enable us to live a life of victory that I believe Jesus died for us to have. Amen. Amen. And so I want to say this. Luke 2 verse 10 said the following. Luke 2 verse 10 said, the angel came to the shepherds. This is the Christmas story. I almost sang that song, that Christmas song this morning. Joy, unspeakable joy. I'm not going to bore you with my singing, <clears throat> but I have other gifts. But, you know, in that scripture in Luke 2 verse 10, it said that the angel of the Lord came to the shepherds and he said to them, greetings, I bring you good news of great joy. Great joy. You know, the gospel is the message of great joy. But some Christians live like it's the, it's the message of the Great Depression. And I want to be respectful this morning, but you know, one of the marks of a, of a believer of Jesus Christ, filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit, is joy. Is anyone agreeing with me this morning? Joy of the Lord. Where is our joy as believers? And my heart and prayer this morning as I was studying the joy of the Lord is that the Lord will truly deposit a fresh joy in us today so that when we walk out of here, we will be marked by our joy. I'm not talking about superficial happiness. I'm talking about a joy that will ground us, that will give us strength, that will allow us to endure whatever circumstances may come. Because Jesus did say, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And so I believe I'm not going to try and teach a message here this morning to say that life's going to be smooth sailing the moment you accept Jesus into your life. I think we can all agree that's not the truth. There's nobody worth seeing it. Okay? I'm not going to sugarcoat the gospel. But what is the truth of the gospel? It's the good news of great joy. 
So I want to pray that this is really something that will be a revelation to us afresh today, that we are supposed to live with joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength, the Bible says. And I love how we always quote that scripture, but do we even know where it came from? We're going to take a look. Where did that scripture come from? Who spoke those words and why did they speak those words? And I believe that's going to be powerful this morning. Okay. One of the features of a born-again believer is joy. Have a look at Romans 14 verse 17. If you are following the notes on version, it is on there. Romans 14 verse 17 says this. After all, the kingdom of God is not a matter of getting the food and drink one likes, but instead it is righteousness, the state that makes a person acceptable to God, heart peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Everyone say joy in the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm going to make you engage with me today, and I'm going to prove to you that it's scriptural. Is enig iemand in vir dit? Okay, dankie vir die tien. Okay, what is the joy of the Lord? What is the joy of the Lord? I always like to start with the definition. You know, the world speaks of happiness. And happiness is also biblical. That's amazing. I love to be happy. Last weekend, Independence Weekend, we managed with a couple of our team, we went to Lake Oonap. Hoekom was ek nog nooit daar nie, sê ek vir Johannes? Ja, hoef my in windhoek sonder water, and there is just an hour away, is daar water. Hoekom het hy my nog nooit sinte gevat nie? And we were there on the kayaks, and I was happy. Because my circumstances were lovely. If I can be near water, I'm like in my happy place. So that was really lovely. But you know, that's not the joy of the Lord. Although I do believe that was the joy of the Lord. But that's not what we're talking about. The world will tell us happiness is an emotion evoked by well-being, success, good fortune. In other words, I am happy when my circumstances are in the way that I desire. My circumstances are everything's working out. I've got peace in my home. My salary is coming in every month. Um, you know, I go to church. The coffee was good this morning. You know, they even had little extra muffins. I got to eat something. My circumstances are lovely. That's happiness. But that's not what the joy of the Lord is. The joy of the Lord goes so much deeper than our circumstances. True godly joy is not based on circumstances or the things we possess or even what we see and experience. It is a supernatural fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is a supernatural fruit of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to read through... No, I'm not going to do that today. We're going to stick to Nehemiah. I said to the team, just go with me today because I said to the Holy Spirit, I'm not going to stick to my notes today. I guess no... Los, let the Heilige Geest come beweeg. Now, I'm going to stick to Nehemiah this morning, but I think I'm going to continue next week because this is actually such an important topic, and the more I study it, the more I believe we need to go deeper into the Word. But you know, there's a great book that if, you want, if you're looking for something to read this week, I would recommend, if you're still in Proverbs, that's great, but if you want to add something more, let's go deeper. We are living Word. The book of Philippians is a great book to read. The book of Philippians is also called the book of joy. The book of joy, where it speaks and it gives us a picture of true godly joy. And you know that that book was written by the Apostle Paul when his circumstances was anything but joyful. In fact, his circumstances were actually horrendous. He wrote four books whilst in prison in a Roman prison. Now, if you go and do some history research on the state of Roman prisons, I think you will actually become scared. They had horrific, horrific conditions. In fact, when Paul wrote the book of Philippians to the Philippian church, whom he loved dearly, they were a church that supported him financially, even though they were a poorer church. They supported him financially. They prayed for him. They were always looking after him. He started that church when the Holy Spirit spoke to him in Acts 16. When he received what the Bible calls the Macedonian call, he had a vision, he had a dream, where someone in Macedonia said, come and help us. And he went and 
one of the churches he planted was the church in Philippi. And he wrote to this church. And you know, I, did, I came across an article somewhere in the week where I read about this young girl who was working, she was on a working holiday somewhere in Thailand, Koh Samoy, somewhere there. And she was arrested for signing for a package. I think everyone knows this story about this young girl. She signed for a package that was uh, drugs delivered to the restaurant. And she's been in prison for two and a half years in a Thai prison. She just turned 23. And I thought to myself of prison. I thought to myself of the circumstances, what you have to go through when you are put in prison, especially if you're innocent, but even if you're guilty. Prison is a horrible place. Has anyone ever been in a prison? I'm not asking if you've been in prison. Thank the Lord, yes. I hope all is okay. Ne? I remember um, a couple of years ago, I can't remember which country we were actually. We did two mission trips in, in a previous church that I was involved in. One was Mozambique and another one was we went to, I think, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Botswana. We did all three countries. And I can't remember which one it was. It's so funny. I was trying to think about it all weekend. For the life of me, I can't remember. But what I do remember is we did a prison outreach. And I remember us going into this prison, and I remember being so scared. Because th these were some of the worst criminals, according to the people that were taking us into prison. They were men and women in the place where we were going to minister. I thought I would feel safer if we just go into the women's side. But we went into where the men were on one side and the women were on one side. And our little team came in there. Jesus freaks, Oskop Daed. And our team leader was doing a message. And you know how many people accepted the Lord that day? I remember experiencing the presence of the Lord so thick, so tangibly, even though I went in there with such fear, imagining the kind of people that were in there, the kind of things they did to get in there. Anyway, that has nothing to do with the point. I just remember I was in a prison before. And I thought to myself what a prison looks like on the inside, what the things that happen inside a prison. And here the Apostle Paul is writing a book on joy. He's writing a letter to the Philippi church, and he's telling them to rejoice because he's rejoicing because he's in prison, and he's in prison for preaching the gospel. Jock always talks about mission trips they went on where you could get arrested for preaching the gospel. Okay, and he's talking to them about joy. And he's in the cell, and actually at that time, he wasn't sure whether he was either going to be beheaded in the next few days, whether he was going to be publicly executed, but he believed that he was going to die for his faith. So for all intents and purposes, he thought this is the last letter that I'm writing. And his message is about joy. So when I think about that and I think about what he had written, and I read through the book of Philippians, I think to myself, this has to be supernatural. Want wie in sy rechte mind is joyful in die omstandighede? But the Apostle Paul had a different revelation. He had a different revelation like Jesus for the joy set before him. The joy set before him. He was like, if I die today, the joy before me is I get to be in heaven with Jesus for all of eternity. So why do we even fear death? We don't need to fear death when we are believers. Do you believe that? We don't need to fear death when we are believers. Can you imagine just being with Jesus all day long? I also believe with a new glorified body, I'll get a glorified voice. I'm going to be leading worship in heaven. That's my prayer. Okay, where were we? All right, the biblical definition of joy, when the Apostle Paul in, in the book of Philippians speaks about joy, the Greek word there is kara, 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 and it's related to both grace and gift rejoice or to express intense joy. And it speaks of this idea that it is a response of joy to a gift that we have received. 
The Bible speaks about how heaven rejoices with great joy every time someone comes into the kingdom of God. Do you know that heaven is not a still plucky waar amal so sit? Ek wil nou iets sê, maar ek gaan nie. Heaven is not a place like that. Ek dink dit is crazy daarboe. I am personally so excited. Because if it is the gospel of good news, dan hoekom moet ek so like? Verstaan? Is anybody with me this morning? It is the great news of joy that Jesus died for our sins. And so I'm going to keep emphasizing this this morning because I want to get us to understand that it has nothing to do with our circumstances. There is a joy that needs to come from this place over here. And it doesn't mean I'm all chirpy and singing and going to Kira like Marissa every Sunday morning. It doesn't mean you, but you can have you can still have joy, and at least maybe smile. Amal smile gau? Makes us even look different when we smile. You know, and joy, you know that joy is related to strength. Joy is related to strength. And I believe as a pastor, you know, Johannes and I see this all the time, and, you know, people come to us as pastors. It is our job to equip and to train you for the work of ministry. And so many times people come to us and they ask for prayer and they come and see us for, you know, advice from Scripture. How do I handle this situation? How do I deal with this? And we absolutely love that. That's what God has called us to do. But you know how many people we see where their their reality is depression, their reality is stress, worry, anxiety, and they ask this question, where is my joy? Where is my joy? And you know, if joy is strength, that means if I've got no joy, if I don't have the joy of the Lord, that means I'm so tapped emotionally, physically in every part of my being, any difficult circumstance that's going to come my way will actually incapacitate me. I won't be able to have the strength to endure whatever I need to endure because we all have trials. We all have tribulations. We all have difficult seasons. Sometimes it's self-inflicted. Other times we have absolutely no control over it. And maybe we'll talk about that next week. How do I walk through trials with the joy of the Lord as my strength? But today I just want to lay that foundation of what is the joy of the Lord. And so I want us to have a look at this scripture, Proverbs 17, 22. Proverbs 17, 22. You know, when we spoke about wisdom, we said we're going to read a book of Proverbs every day. So if anyone has gone and you've done that and you've gone past Proverbs 17, you would have read this. And I love this scripture. It says, a happy heart is good medicine and a joyful mind causes healing. Think about that for a moment. A joyful mind causes healing. Where? Where? I believe in my physical body, in my emotions, in my mind, in my entire soul being. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Do we see that we need the joy of the Lord in our lives this morning? We need to live with the joy of the Lord to endure and to live victoriously. A broken spirit dries up the bones. Okay, so I want us to go to the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. We are going to read through just three verses, but I'm going to give you some context just for time. And you know, the Bible in the Old Testament is so interesting. I read through many of the stories in the Old Testament where you would see the Israelites, then they would serve God, then they would have an idol, they would drop away from the Lord, the nuns would be chaos, and then they come back to the Lord crying, and then the Lord forgives them, and then they go back on the same route. And, but you know, in the cycle of the Israelites, back and forth, back and forth between serving the Lord and then serving their idols, they got to a place in 2 Chronicles 30, 36, where it says they rededicated their lives to the Lord. So they came back to the Lord, realized their sin, came back to the Lord. And it says that there was great rejoicing because the Lord poured his joy into their hearts. The Lord and heaven rejoices when we come back into alignment with him. That's one of the first places we receive our joy of the Lord again.
So in Nehemiah, I'm just going to give you the context. Nehemiah and Ezra, they were at a place where Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. And he had heard that the walls of Jerusalem were broken down. And so it stirred his heart and it actually grieved his heart because he came from there and he went back. He asked the king, can I go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls, to restore what was broken down? And so Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah were actually one book. It was written as one book, but eventually it was split for the purposes of the word. And that's a long story that I don't have time to go into. But basically, they led the people of Judah to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. And Ezra was the scribe, which means he was the teacher. He was the priest reading from the word of God. And so they had rebuilt the city walls. I think it was something like 52 days. It's a beautiful story. It's a very, very rich passage of scripture. If you want to go read through that as well, I'm giving you lots of homework. But I want to pick up the story where Ezra, the scribe, came, and it says that they all gathered together. The yellow folk, and he opened up the book of the law that Moses gave them. And the Bible says that they were so in awe and in such reverence and fear of the Lord that the moment he opened up, they all stood up. And in this position, they stayed for hours and hours and hours. Well, Ezra read from the book of the law. What's going to happen as I now say, "Oh, my God, stand up, be free, rest from the period." I'm joking. Let's come and sit there. But can you just imagine that for a moment? The fear of the Lord, and they had realized in their hearts, "Oh my goodness, we went so far off from the Lord." And Ezra was reading, and this is where we're going to pick up the story. He was reading from the Word. The Bible said that they listened so attentively and they responded enthusiastically with, Amen, Amen. I told you that was biblical. The reason I ask you sometimes to agree with me is because it does something in your heart when you also agree. It brings us into unity. And it doesn't make me feel like I'm preaching the Word alone. We're preaching to one another, Amen. Okay, like a better than is that. Amen. Come on. When we go to the Vundu, there's only ten people. <sighs> Listen, they start shouting Amen before you even get into the church. <laughs> it always encourages me so much. I love that. Okay, so let's take up the story. Nehemiah 8, verse 9 to 12. And it says, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all of them, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. And then Ezra told them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet drink. Drink the sweet drink and send portions to him for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. And be not grieved and depressed. Another translation says, do not worry. For the joy of the Lord is your strength and stronghold. And so the Levites, they were the priests, quieted all the people saying, be still for this day is holy. Do not be grieved, do not be sad. And all the people went their way to eat, drink, and send portions to the poorer people. They were sharing for those who had none. And make great rejoicing, for they had understood the words that were declared to them. And I thought, what a powerful, powerful picture of people coming back to the Lord. They realized in that moment, the moment when God's words were read to them, they started feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit was present in the Old Testament. They started feeling that conviction. And that's why they had this attitude of almost depression. Because they realized they grieved the heart of the Lord. They had moved so far away from His law, from His words, from His best for their lives. That they wanted to weep. They were so repentive. 
they felt not worthy in God's eyes. And you know what the Lord spoke through his, I almost said prophet, through his priest, through the scribe, through Nehemiah and Ezra. He said to them, do not weep. I am your God. I'm going to give you the joy, my joy. And I want you to go and rejoice because my forgiveness is there for you. You have come back. I have accepted you. Now go forth with my joy. And you know what is so profound to me is that this is actually a prophetic picture of you and I today. Do you know what the name Nehemiah means? It means Yahweh comforts. Who is our comforter? Who's the Holy Spirit? When we receive salvation, we receive the joy of the Lord, the joy of our salvation. The Holy Spirit comes. He pours the love of the Father into our hearts. That's the only way we can love Jesus back. We receive his love first. And the Holy Spirit comforts us and he says, stop grieving your old life. I am making you a brand new creation. My forgiveness now releases you. There is no more guilt and condemnation for you. And I will rebuild your walls. I will rebuild your life if you allow my Holy Spirit into your life. And to me, it's such a powerful picture. That is the true joy of the Lord. It is the joy of the Lord that we receive from His Spirit to be able to live the life that He has called us to live. You and I are not called to live under the enemy's feet. Amen? We are not called to live defeated. We are called to live victoriously. We are called, that doesn't mean our circumstances are going to be perfect, but that means I'm going to walk in my authority, and they will start for you. Want my koning is baie groter as jou tricks in jou deceivement. Amen? The joy of the Lord is a key to the kingdom that will give us strength, that will give us power, and I pray that sinks into our hearts this morning. I'm going to keep repeating myself. Do not worry. Who needs that word this morning? Do not worry. Can I get a moedig for ochend? Hou op stress. I'm preaching to myself. Stop worrying. Is your God the king of the universe or not? Is your God your provider, the owner of the cattle on a thousand hills or not? Either we believe it or we don't. He is God almachtig. Okay, the same God of Nehemiah is the same God you and I serve. The same God who comforts there is the same God who comforts today. And whatever it is that you need, the answer is Jesus. So many times people come to us for answers. And I find myself at the end of every counseling. I'm just saying that to all of you right now. Don't come with that expectation. I'm going to teach you back to Jesus. It's the gift that God gave me. I can't feel luister, but I'm going to point you back to Jesus. Because he's the answer. He's the teacher. I'm going to point you back to the Holy Spirit. Because he's your comforter. He's your helper. I can't be your helper. I can't be your counselor. I can only be the pointer to the teacher, the counselor, the helper. Does that make sense this morning? But don't I think you can't come and have coffee? But does it make sense this morning? He's the one that we need to point to. I'm so far off my notes. Here, help me. Okay, rejoice. That translates when when it says that they made great rejoicing. When they left there, the folk, they made great rejoicing. That means joy, gladness, pleasure, happiness. Bible's version of happiness. Their hearts experienced sorrow, but in that moment, they realized that after Nehemiah comforted them, that the true joy of the Lord will be their strength. Holiness and joy go together. What was the Lord doing when he says, come back into my precepts, come back into the way Bible, Scripture, his word, gives us guidelines, gives us direction. Sometimes people think when I need to become holy, all my joy and happiness will go. That's such a worldly mindset. Because the true joy of the Lord is found in the passages of that scripture. It's found in the word. It's found when I do things God's way. That is true pleasure. 
Okay, that is what the Lord wants for us. That is where rejoicing will come. That is where joy of the Lord will come. Okay, come on, focus. True joy is a fruit of the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Galatians 5, we can quickly go through that. Galatians 5, 22 to 23, we know this. We've been speaking about the Holy Spirit, so I feel like this word is just really touching on what Johannes and Jacques have been speaking about the last two weeks. But the fruit of the Spirit... Everyone say, the result of His presence within us. He's already in you. He's already in me. Is love, unselfish concern for others, joy, inner peace, patience. I love this. Not the ability to wait, but how we act while waiting. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things there is no law. Acts 13.52 says the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. It always comes with Holy Spirit. I can't receive Holy Spirit and not have joy. It actually doesn't, doesn't work like that. You can't separate them. Holy Spirit is love, His joy, His goodness, His kindness, His faithfulness, His self-control. Meet you all men. True joy is supernatural. Okay, we said that heaven rejoices over every single person who gives their hearts back to the Lord. Who says, Lord, I want to come back into the kingdom of light. Those are massive party in Yamal. So I really think that church needs to get a revelation that also is in a party. I know we're holy, so we don't need. But what I'm trying to explain is there is a joy. There is a joy that is supernatural. The Bible says in Zephaniah 3, verse 17, that the Lord rejoices over you with singing. Do you know that the Lord is singing over you? He's got a joy over you. He loves waking up and thinking, ah, ina genau met my komtijd spandeer. He gets excited. He wants to be with us. He's rejoicing over you. Some people just need to receive that this morning. The Lord rejoices over you. Stop feeling condemned. Stop feeling like you're not good enough. Stop feeling like you're not worthy. It's a lie from the pit of hell. Many times our joy will also come from believing that God rejoices over us. I actually feel one of the messages we should also continuously bring is that God loves you. Sometimes we think that's a kindergarten message. You know, if every single believer truly believed that God loved them, we will live our lives completely differently. Because out of the love of the Father, out of knowing that my Father is pleased with me, I walk in boldness, I walk in confidence, I walk in victory, I walk in love, I walk in power. Amen. I feel like I'm going to be ignored today. Okay. You know, one day we're going to enter into heaven and be part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's going to be a celebration. It's going to be a stiff, traditional atmosphere that we're going to sit in. No, friends. If that is your picture of church, I'm so sorry. It was my picture of church. But you know, God came and broke that down. I was in a church where we shouted for joy. We jumped up and down. It was awesome. I said to the team this morning, I remember jumping up and down in worship. It took me a while to get there because I was so self-conscious. Okay, I was so... People can't look at me. People can't... I was always all after. But you know what? Every time I jumped, every time I worshipped, every time I clapped, every time I did something out of my box, the Lord freed me layer for layer for layer. Fear, anxiety, depression, man... Hierdie angstigheid, al hierdie goeikies, panic attacks, layer for layer for layer for layer. And now I don't care what people think. I really don't. When it comes to worshipping, and ek wil die Heere dien, and ek wil op my Facebook praat van Jesus, want ek gaan, if you don't like it, unfollow me. Whatever. <laughs> die Heere is op ander plek met my veroogend, is dit oké? Okay? Oké. Okay. What I actually want to say is also this. 
Why are so many Christians living without joy? Number one, I believe, if you're taking notes, broken fellowship with the Lord. One of the main reasons many believers are living without joy is because joy comes from a life connected to the Lord. If I disconnect, I'm not talking about a believer and an unbeliever. I'm talking about I'm a believer, but I'm not connected to the vine. I'm not living in close fellowship. That's like being in relationship with someone, but you never talk to them. You never have any time with them, never have any fellowship with them. Who knows, they will become a distance in your relationship. Have a look at this. This is Jesus speaking, John 15. John 15, verse 10 and 11, I think it is. And it says, if you keep my commandments, if you continue to obey my instructions, my word, you will abide in my love and live in it, just as I have obeyed my Father's commandments and live on in his love. And then he says in verse 11, I have told you these things. What things? That we need to abide in Him. We need to live by His commandments. So that my joy and delight may be in you. And that your joy and gladness may be of full measure, complete and overflowing. Do you know when we bring ourselves into alignment back with the Lord, our joy will increase, not decrease. Holiness and joy go together. I'm talking about the supernatural joy. Jesus said, come back to me, come back into close abiding fellowship with me, and your joy will increase. You know, it's so the truth. I don't know if you've ever experienced it, that I can, I can go through difficult circumstances, and I don't wake up every single morning all chirpy, ready to go, worship, ha, oh, hallelujah. But sometimes I wake up thinking, oh, I feel a little bit heavy this morning, or I can't listen for what now for what call me. But the moment I come back into the presence of the Lord, the moment I get myself into His Word, sometimes I have to start with praise and worship because that gets me there faster. Something changes on the inside. I can feel that joy coming back. I can feel that hope coming back. I can feel that fire being rekindled again with His presence. And that's honestly, for me personally, there's no other way I find that I can keep that fire going in my heart. Number one, broken fellowship with the Lord. We need to come back to the Lord. Number two, unconfessed sin. Psalm 97 verse 11 says this. This is really powerful. It says, light shines on the godly and joy on those whose hearts are right. If your heart is not right with the Lord, if there is something that you are feeling guilty about, maybe you just haven't brought it back to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me, help me, Holy Spirit, help me to get rid of this thing, help me to do this differently. That guilt and condemnation will eat up every single ounce of joy that you have. Jesus said, Oh, the Bible says that there is no guilt and condemnation in Jesus Christ. In other words, we need to understand God's mercy. We need to understand God's grace and understand that while the Lord is working in this journey with us, we need to understand our righteousness. We can come to Him and say, Lord, I missed it today. I am so sorry. I yelled at my kids. I yelled at my husband. Whatever it is. Lord, my mond het afgegaan met die persoon. Ek is so jammer, vergewe my Heere. Immediately, our hearts are back in alignment with the Lord. And it says then, the light shines, joy shines on that heart. We just need to bring it back to the Lord. We don't need to live with guilt and condemnation. And if you wake up every single morning feeling guilty, feeling like the Lord doesn't love you, He's angry with you, we need to pray. Because that means we don't understand His righteousness. Righteousness is something I need to accept by faith. Amen. Number three, I believe one of the reasons many Christians are living without joy is because of deception. Many of us, quite frankly, just believe lies. So when we said before, liberating truths, that is a course that we do that teaches you the truth instead of the lie. So every place where I believe a lie, I need to replace it with the truth of God's Word. I meet believers that tell me, oh, I just don't like reading the Bible. Okay, well, start there. Start there, because you're never going to be able to replace any lies with truth. 
If I'm not in the Word, I don't have the truth. So the truth will set you free. The truth is a person. The truth is Jesus. So, you know, we need to get rid of the lies that we believe. Lies that we believe that we're not good enough. That's nonsense. God has got a purpose and a plan for your life. There's gifts upon your life, whether you know it or not. You have got something unique on the inside of you that only you are bringing into this world, no one else. Only you. But you need Jesus, you need the Holy Spirit to bring it into life. To bring it into purpose for the kingdom of God. And you know what I found, I'm running ahead of myself, is that when I found my purpose, true peace and true joy I could feel on the inside, no matter what a bad day I'm having. And I just want to say this, today I'm, I'm not necessarily talking, we'll talk about next week when we go through tragedy, when we go through extreme heartache. How do I walk in the joy of the Lord? It is possible. But again, it's supernatural. But I want to talk today just about the foundation of understanding that I need the joy of the Lord. And I need to pursue it. Okay, number four. I believe many times that we are not walking in joys because we, we're just carnally focused. What does that mean? Jock spoke last week about walking in the Spirit. It just means I'm walking in the flesh every day. I'm just not actually seeking the Holy Spirit. I'm not seeking how to walk in the Spirit. I'm forgetting that I'm actually walking in a spiritual battle. Amen. The Bible says that we are not in a natural war. We are in a spiritual war. Jesus already won the war, but we're in the battle every day. Okay, the enemy will come for everything that you have. But you need to know that you've got the weapons to defeat him. Otherwise, you're not going to be in victory. So, how can we then receive the true joy of the Lord? There is good news. Are you ready for some good news this morning? I believe all of it is good news. Number one, we need to return to Jesus. Have a look at Psalm 51 verse 12. Psalm 51 is the psalm where David comes before the Lord and he is absolutely broken. He is full of regret. He is full of guilt and condemnation, and he's bringing all of his sin. He killed a man because he impregnated her wife, Uriah and Bathsheba, and he's bringing all of his heart and all of his confession and all of his repentance he's bringing to the Lord, and he says to the Lord, Lord, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. And you know, the Bible calls David a man after God's own heart. He did some pretty horrendous things. But how come he was still a man after God's own heart? Because he was able to recognize the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and he was able to bring it before the Lord and say to the Lord, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me. Come and restore the joy of my salvation. I want to have that fire again. I want to have that passion again. Some of us need to be rekindled this morning. That fire needs to come alive again. If you don't feel on fire for the Lord, I want to pray for you today. Because the church needs to be on fire for Jesus. And I heard, I heard recently um, someone that I listen to frequently. And you know, it spoke to my heart so much. He said, he said to his church, Church, are you in love with Jesus? It wasn't to condemn them. It was an honest question. Church, are you in love with Jesus? I'm not talking about have you prayed the sinner's prayer. I'm not talking about if you do open your Bible occasionally. I'm not talking about if you come to church. Are you in love with Jesus? Do you think about Him? Do you pursue Him with everything that you have? And it convicted me. I'm the pastor. (laughs) Not convicted, but it just made me think, and it made me feel like, Lord, even in ministry, we can lose Jesus and continue on with the ministry. And I said, Lord, can I just, until you come back, be passionately in love with you? What does it take for me to be passionately in love with you? And I just felt the Lord spoke softly to my spirit. Just stay close to me. Keep holding my hand. Don't let go of me. I won't let go of you. It's just like so much Johannes in the winkel in Gan. I do like holding his hand, except when I want to move faster and he wants to move slower. But 
but I like holding his hand. <laughs> Maybe he likes holding my hand so he can feel like he can control me in the store. <laughs> but I felt like that's, that's what Jesus was saying, just hold my hand. So he says, okay, Jared, this is easy enough, I can do this. Just keep holding his hand. Stay in love with Jesus. Then we don't have to worry about anything else. Number two, we need to pursue his presence. You see how the points is all the same no matter what subject we preach. I heard someone also say to his church, you know, I don't, I don't know why you expect a different message every week because I'm just going to preach the gospel to you every week. And that's the message of good news. So... It's the same what we're doing here. Um, I've got a different topic, but the bottom line is we've got to come back to Jesus. We've got to keep holding his hand. We've got to pursue his presence. Because in his presence, there is fullness of joy. Some of us are looking for the presence. We're looking for the joy. The joy is in his presence. I felt the joy of the Lord in my heart this morning as we were worshiping. So it's a deep I don't know how to describe it, just a deep well where I just feel so safe in him. And I'm like, Jesus, come on, more come. It's okay. I mean, Psalm 16, for those who are following, you will show me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Number three, I believe, get planted, get on purpose. We say this every week as well. But you've got a purpose. I've got a purpose. Many times people are like, what is my calling? What is my purpose? Well, just get plugged in somewhere. God will lead you. God will show you. I found my purpose through serving. And people started recognizing. People gave me different opportunities. And I discovered by stumbling, getting up, stumbling, getting up, serving every week, doing the mundane, doing the little things. The Lord started speaking and revealing to me where he wanted me. You know, God can't move a parked car. So it means sometimes we just need to start moving. Don't worry about, is it the right place, is it not? God will get you where he wants you. He's big enough to direct each one of us. But there is a purpose. And you know when you found your purpose? I'll never forget it. The first time I preached uh, in Living Word Cape Town, when I joined JC's church there, JC prayed for me, and as he was praying on the stage, he said, you've arrived to do what you were born to do. And something in my whole being just clicked. And I was like, yes, Lord, this is it. And I feel so content, and I feel so at peace, and I feel like anything can happen. This is what I meant to do. This is what God has for me. And I'll keep doing it until Jesus comes. But there is something that every single person has on this earth. And I believe you'll find your truest joy when you do what God has called you to do. When you do what you were born to do. Many of us are already walking in that. I mean, number four, we need to get into the Word. Psalm 119 verse 162. It's a long psalm. <laughs> it says, I rejoice at your Word as one who finds great treasure. This is great treasure. Jeremiah 15, he says that the moment I ate your words, it became sweet and it filled my heart with joy. We just need to get into the Word. We need to get into the Word. Number five, and you can stand as we share this, and I'm going to pray for us. The fifth thing I believe that we need to we need to set our heart upon, if we're going to walk in the true joy of the Lord, is we need to stop reasoning. True joy of the Lord is a spiritual fruit. I can't, I can't let my head get in the way. And that's really the same for everything we do in this life of the kingdom. Some of us will find freedom in our walk with the Lord when we just stop reasoning. I'm not saying you can't ask questions. The Lord loves questions. He's not scared of our questions. I'm saying stop reasoning. There's a difference. 
I was addicted to reasoning and worrying and trying to figure things out in my own natural ability. We're not called to do that. We're called to, in faith, come to Him and He will give us all the answers that we need. But let me pray for us this morning. I want to pray for the first group of people. If you are here this morning and you can just close your eyes and just take a moment with the Holy Spirit. If you are here this morning and you feel like, well, you know, Marissa, I am a believer. I love Jesus. But I don't know if I'm in love. I remember when I started dating you, Ines, I fell in love. Are you in love with Jesus this morning? And if you are not, there is no condemnation. I want you to just raise your hand. I want to pray a prayer of blessing over you this morning. If you feel like, Lord, I'm not in love with you. I want to be in love. I want to be passionately fiery in love with you. Or if you're here this morning and you've never, ever given your heart to Jesus. You've never given and surrendered your life to Jesus. I want you to also raise your hand. Keep your hands raised. I'm going to pray for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to do a corporate prayer for us. And why don't we just all pray together? Lord Jesus, I come to you today with all that I am. And I want to ask you to pour out your love to pour out your fire over me, over my head, over my heart, over my entire being. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to fall in love with you. I want to serve you with everything that I have. I want to be changed, Lord. And only you can do that. I was going to pray over you. Father, I thank you for every person in this room. Lord, I pray that through your precious Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would pour out your love over every single one of us this morning. Lord, pour out your love that goes so deep on the inside of us. Lord, that it bubbles up on the inside of us, that it comes out of our mouth, it comes out of our actions. Lord, I pray that as we go out of this place today, we will be set ablaze. We will be so on fire for you that nothing can stop us, Lord. Lord, we do not want to be cold for you. We don't want to be lukewarm for you. We want to be on fire for your kingdom. We receive your love this morning. And I want to pray for a second group of people. If you are here and you're saying, Marissa, I feel like I've lost my joy. Can you just pray for my joy to be restored? I want you to raise your hand. We're going to ask the Lord to restore His joy, His supernatural joy. Father, you see every hand raised in this room. And Lord, I pray through your precious Holy Spirit that you would pour out the oil of joy for the garment and the garment of praise, Lord, for the oil of mourning, right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I just pray a release. I pray for every depression to break in the name of Jesus under the sound of my voice. Every dark cloud about, above every person to break in the name of Jesus. I come against depression. I come against worry. I come against anxiety. You will go in the name of Jesus. This will be a house of joy. Your people will live with true joy on the inside of them. And I pray, Father, that you would just fill us afresh, Lord. Thank you for the fruit of the Spirit. Lord, I pray that as we go out of this place today, Lord, we will walk in joy. We will walk in victory. Lord, we will surrender anything that is keeping us from holding on to you, from following you 100%. Lord, the time has come for us to walk in your joy. Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Just receive from the Lord this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I ask that you would just touch every person in this place. From the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord, till it overflows. Till it overflows. Danke, Jera. Dank Jy, Heere. Laat die olie net vloei, 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 vloei oor elke persoon. 
Lord, I pray that we will be passionate seekers of your kingdom. I pray for a new hunger. I pray for a new thirst upon your people. In the name of Jesus. You are the God of hope. You are the God of joy. Set us ablaze so that we can go out, Lord, and preach your kingdom to all creation. In the name of Jesus, and everyone said, Amen. Amen.